All right. <laughs> well, helps today. Some new faces. Yeah. Howdy. I'm Scott Smith. Um, we are on the third week of uh, looking at our Mormon Christian. We started out with just kind of intro to the question and what we're really asking. Last week was a whole bunch of um, history according to Christianity. Early, you know, eternity past through most of the Old Testament. We actually did finish the Old Testament last week. So this week I'm going to try and get up through the Reformation. So kind of blast through quick. This is obviously not comprehensive. This is very fast. But the idea is to give you, an idea, give you a sense of what has happened according to Christian tradition, Christian history, which I think is true. You can, you can verify this, not only by the Bible, but there's all kinds of external sources that we can look at. Um, but we're looking at it. We're just going to go with the Christian record, and then we'll compare afterwards, starting next week, to the, the Mormon version of history. So the primary things I'm hitting are those things which, you know, not, like I said, it's obviously not comprehensive in the time we have, but the idea is let's hit the important doctrinal points of Christianity and also some key points in history um, where Mormons will differ. So I just kind of run through them now. If you're all interested in it, I mentioned last week I like history. Um, <laughs> I, I thought about doing a church history class at some point um, that's a little more in-depth just because I enjoy it, um, but I might be the only one. But if that's of any interest, let me know. Um, so, I want to start by kind of reviewing part of what we did last week, but not, obviously, in the depth, just to look at who the Jewish, not the Jewish people, which we did more last year, but the, the part of the world that we see as Israel, eh, not so much now, but in Jesus' time, where did that come from, and how, what happened from the beginning through the Old Testament, then in between into the New Testament. So, starting from the beginning, there were no Jews. Uh, no people, but when there were when there started to be people, there weren't Jews for a while. Jews refers to a very specific subset of people. We'll see in a minute, in, in a couple minutes. Um, after the fall, we talked about last week. Adam and Eve and their families left the Garden of Eden. Um, their family continued to spread, uh, not only to grow in number but spread geographically. Um, at some point, God judges man's wickedness with a flood. Um, Noah's offspring, Noah and his family were on the flood. Their offspring spread throughout the ancient Near East. Um, the ancient Near East with respect to Britain, because that's when they first started talking about these things. So the Near East was the, what we call basically the Middle East right now. Far East was the Orient. Um, we still use those terms now. but um, So Noah's offspring spread through what we consider Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia Egypt, Iran, Asia Minor, uh, which is Turkey today. Um, not too long after that, they, people decided they wanted to build a tower, make a name for themselves, whatever that means. Um, they want to be, you know, show that they're the hot shots. They're going to build a tower in the plain of Shinar. Um, that's, we refer to it now as a Tower of Babel. After that, God spreads everybody out, both by, by confusing their language and by spreading them out geographically. It's 11 whole verses, I think, or 9 verses in the beginning of Genesis 11. There's not a whole lot there. What that means, I don't know. But that's that was when a lot of languages were languages and, and uh, dispersion happened to people. Uh, not too long after that, Abram is on the scene. Okay, still no Jews um, by name. Abram's <coughs> family leaves a town called Ur. For a long time, people have thought that was in Iraq. It may be present-day Iraq. Um, there's another theory that it was maybe in Turkey. Those are the two leading theories, somewhere either in Iraq and, or Tur uh, southern Iraq or northern Turkey, which are a, a, a few, a little, little ways apart from each other. But his family's there. They leave there to head for Canaan. Um, when, uh, somewhere along the way, uh, they stopped at Haran, another town uh, not too far from Turkey. Somewhere in that area, between Ur and Haran, God comes to Abram and says, I'm going to make your family enormous going to be like the numbers, you know, the grain of sand on the, on, the, on the seashore, and you know, you won't be, won't be able to count the number of people in your family. Um, and says that you will possess this land of Canaan, this land you're going to, eventually you will possess this. Um, so he keeps going towards Canaan. Uh, roughly, Canaan is an area of today's Israel and Lebanon, give or take, it's about that area. Um, at that time it was loaded with Canaanites. Um, it was Canaan. Um, so that was an obstacle they had ahead of them. Um, so Abraham's son Isaac and his grandson Jacob were given the same promise. God repeats this promise. 
uh, and they eventually lived in Canaan, but didn't possess it. They were under the rule of the locals. There's a severe famine. Um, Jacob, uh, who is now called Israel, he's been renamed, um, they pick up and leave because of this famine. There's nothing to eat, and they go to Goshen in northern Egypt, and that's where they're going to hang out because there's food there. Stay there for a bit. Um, because they're in northern Egypt, Pharaoh's ruling Egypt. He needs some workers with their cheap or free. Decides, look at all these people that just came here. You are now belong to us, and we're going to start using you for our labor. So now the Egypt or the uh, Israelites, they're now called Israelites, people of Israel, um, not Jews still technically, uh, but they, the people of Israel are now in captivity under the Egyptians, kind of stumbled into that, and stayed there 400 years. Um, let's see. Uh, centuries later, they, you know, through the through Moses leading, they escape Egypt and then go on a 40-year exodus. And eventually, um, through Joshua and Judges and in those you know, books records, the conquering of Canaan, where they actually they did re-enter Canaan, but also took possession, as God had promised. Um, they spent about five centuries in Canaan, uh, which is now called Israel, roughly the same geography back then, um, because it was promised by God, and it was bounded, you know, described as bounded by certain cities and rivers and things, so that's how they defined the area. Um, so now we've got Israel, which was formerly Canaan, um, about, about five centuries later, it splits into two countries, Israel and Judah. Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Um, Israel, as I mentioned last week, was taken into captivity by the Assyrians. Ju um, yes, Judah was taken into captivity by the Babylonians about 100 years later. Israel dispersed. Um, you can see reference to that in uh, James 1.1. 1, 1. When James writes, which is most considered the first New Testament book written, which would make sense, written by uh, a former Jew, head of the church in Jerusalem, which is close to wherever they started, uh, where Jesus was crucified, so it makes sense that that's where a lot of things kicked off. Um, James 1.1, 1, 1, he writes a letter. The first verse says, to the people of Israel, um, or the, no, I'm sorry, to the 12 tribes scattered throughout the land. It's referring, they, they use language called the dispersion. That was the, the first dispersion. No one knows where they are. They're just kind of spread everywhere. So, um, that's Israel. Judah is still there for 100 years. Um, and then they're taken by Babylon. Babylon, uh, I'm sorry, after a little bit, Persia takes over Bab uh, Babylon. And Cyrus, leader of Persia, says to all the people of Judah, listen, you guys can go back home. Not all of them do, uh, a remnant does. So now of all these people of Israel we had, um, the, the northern kingdom of Israel is gone in this version. The southern kingdom of Judah is, you know, most of them stay there, but some of them go back to Jerusalem. So now we're kind of back into Canaan again. I mean, keep on going and leaving and going and leaving. Back into the promised land. Um, and they, they start spreading again. Um, so now we're about 400 B.C., which is where we ended last week. So that's pretty quick. Um, so now, now they're there. This is the end of the Old Testament. Um, about 100 years later, 300 B.C., um, Judea, which is the, the, the country of Judah, he takes on, this happens all the time, you'll see people and countries and places referred to by different names. Judah was the, the Hebrew name, Judea was the, the Hellenized Greek name, I guess. So Judea, the rule changed hands when Alexander the Great conquered them, conquered Persia, and that began the Hellenistic period, and the Greeks took over. Um, shortly after that, Judea became part of the kingdom of Egypt. Um, then, an interesting, interesting thing happened. About, well, in 167 BC, um, a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, um, he was the king of Syria, he, he comes into the temple, okay, because they, the, uh, the, they're under the control of the Greeks now, um, comes into the temple, dedicates it, the temple that Solomon had built, the second temple, or I'm sorry, that, that Nehemiah and, and Ezra and all of them had built, the second temple, dedicates it to Zeus, which is not cool, you know, under Jewish tradition, dedicates it to Zeus, and as part of the dedication, sacrifices a whole pig on the altar. Not kosher, not cool for the Jews. They didn't like that. If you look 800 years back, Daniel prophesied and spoke of something that would happen called the abomination of desolation. That's what he's talking about. So if you're interested, look back in Daniel for that phrase, and he's referring to this happening. Jesus... Um, 
Jesus even mentioned this having happened 200 years later. Uh, Luke 21, Matthew 24, Mark 13, if you're interested. He says, this abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke about is about to have, or has happened. Um, and when, when um, uh, the temple is again taken, you'll know it's going to happen because you'll see um, the army surrounding Jerusalem. You'll see you know, all these things kind of happening. He's talking about what's about to come. Um, but that's an interesting tie-in. I mean, that, that what Antiochus did is historically very well-grounded, but it was prophesied 800 years before, and Jesus even spoke it in the New Testament. Um, and, he, and Jesus mentioned that after this event, that the people of Judea should leave, that they should leave anybody who's, you know, whatever's going on, you should get out of town. It's, it's going to be bad, um, which we'll get to later. Uh, so it goes through, the, the, you know, the, the goes under control of Maccabees, when the Maccabees get it, um, uh, they they decide to because they're 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 allowed Jewish control again. They rededicate the temple and say this was profaned for use by Zeus, and this was for our God um, Yahweh. So um, because of this, they rededicated the temple. That's um, Hanukkah. So when you hear about Hanukkah, that's talking about rededication of this temple that had fallen from them, taken from them. So after this period, um, the Maccabees start having a civil war between them, and they talk to the, the kind of the reigning uh, country of the area and said, we need some help just to kind of settle things out. We don't need you to take over. Just can you come in here and kind of help restore order? Those guys were Rome, Romans, and they didn't just kind of come in and help. They did take over, which sets the stage to the New Testament. So that gets us from the end of the old to the beginning of the new. How did we go from you know, they're going in and reestablishing their land, and then we start the New Testament, where they're under the foot of somebody else again. How does this happen? So, now, from beginning of the New Testament, um, Jesus is born. Probably 5 B.C., something like that. They had some hiccups and dating things. So, actually, I've, I've started putting some stuff up that I found just to make it less stark in here. There's a few that have timelines there and there that are interesting to look at. You'll see... A little variance in dates because things are, are a little fuzzy in areas. But anyway, around 5 BC, Jesus is born. Um, the fact of his birth and lots of details surrounding it, all in fulfillment of prophecy. Most of them not seen at the time. It was not until later that they started putting these things together. Oh, that's what Isaiah was talking about. This is making sense now. Um, a guy named John the Baptist, who happened to be Jesus' cousin, uh, is, is preparing the way for the Lord. He's baptizing people, leading them in repentance, um, saying that a Messiah is coming. Um, Messiah meaning a promised liberator, someone who's going to free us. What do we mean by freeing? They had a whole different idea of what a liberator was than what God had in mind, and we'll see that kind of play out. Um, 30 years later, um, Jesus begins his public ministry. Um, so, skipping all of that, <laughs> uh, that's what we did. We'll, we'll get into more of the details. But um, Jesus began his public ministry. He had, you know, did his teachings and his miracles and, and whatever. All, all that the Gospels and, and the Epistles record. Um, just the key points in his, in his life, I think, are interesting to look at. His life and death and what that meant. What he did while in coming to earth and what he did on, while on earth um, was a completion of what the Old Testament foreshadowed. Some of it was directly prophesied. Others were just kind of foreshadowed, like um, references made that you don't really understand until after it happens, and then people start to piece together, this is what the prophets were talking about, or this is what Jesus was talking about. Um, so all the things that happened throughout the Old Testament, God gave the law instructions for living. Um, we sin, missed the mark with respect to his instructions. Um, Sin broke our relationship with God. Penalty was due. Sacrifice was necessary. But substitution was possible. All those uh, ideas existed in the Old Testament. But they were just a foreshadowing. So Jesus, in coming, God, God himself did what had been modeled through the Old Testament. Um, incarnation. In becoming human, God himself took the initiative to bridge this chasm that existed now between himself and man. Now... He can relate to us in nearly every way, except for things like sinning. Um, uh, he became flesh, but did so perfectly. Uh, he's referred to as the second Adam, 
because he started things anew and left us with a perfect model for life. But in his life, Jesus was more than just a model of how he should live, which we'll get to when we get into other senses of the word Christian. Christian doesn't mean Jesus gave us a really good idea of a nice way to live peaceably. Um, it was more than that. Uh, through his message and his miracle, the whole point of it was to demonstrate that he was divine. He was saying, I'm God. Can you tell by what I'm doing? I mean, you don't see this happening anywhere else. Um, he was showing who he was, um, although his hearers are not particularly quick with picking up on that. Um, he was illustrating this Messiah role, this liberation, is not an earthly liberation. I'm not going to be um, a political leader or a conquering general. Uh, I'm here to liberate you from bondage of sin and lead you to a higher kingdom. So he's trying to explain to them what this, the purpose of the Messiah was. So that's incarnation. Atonement. In, in Judaism, atonement referred to covering a debt uh, for sins that had been committed. Uh, it was a process that they went through um, in order to get forgiveness and restitution. It could, the process could include things like repentance, uh, acts of service, um, recompense, sacrifice, sometimes punishment. It depends on what you had done and, and what the prescriptions called for. But the goal in the end was that through this atonement process, the sinner is seeking restitution and in effect clear their account. They're trying to get back to a zero balance and start over, which was not possible, but that was the goal. That was atonement on Judaism. So if you see those sorts of things that, that Judaism taught under the, the, that law, um, that, they had a sense of atonement. In Christianity, Jesus fulfilled what, was, what that was foreshadowing. Um, his death on the cross is seen as a punishment we ought to have had, uh, the service that we ought to have performed, uh, and the ultimate sacrifice of giving of human life rather than an animal substitute, which would never be sufficient. Uh, the Old Testament sacrifices had been symbolic, and his death was the only payment that would, would be sufficient for the crime. In Christianity, God himself enacts the restitution required to clear our account. All that is required of us is repentance and submission. And in both cases, Old Testament and New Testament sense, a lot of people take to the, rather, you know, thinking of atonement as at, at one minute. If you break it into words, it isn't where it came from, but um, it's the process of bridging that chasm, getting back in relationship with God as we could have in Eden uh, before the sin entered the picture. So we've got in, incarnation, atonement, um, resurrection. There's another very key, uh, that's the big deal in Christianity. Um, Jesus rose bodily to prove everything that he had said and done actually was true. I mean, when you die and then come back to life, then people start going, okay, what did he say? Because a lot of people said crazy stuff, but this guy was dead, so maybe we should look at what he said. You know, he's, there's something different about him. Um, he rose from the dead under his own power, giving physical evidence of who he was, and that this restoration of relationship and of the whole system had been effective. Uh, it also foreshadowed the, foreshadowed the future that we could have of a, a bodily, uh, bodily resurrection. So, in a nutshell, that was the high points of, of what Jesus did that was foreshadowed in the Old Testament, made complete in his life and death. Um, at the end, he rose, called the Ascension, rose to be with the Father, and said he was going to prepare a place for us. Uh, when he does this, last thing he does, gives marching orders before he leaves. Okay, I've told you a lot of things. The main thing is this. Uh, I want you to spread the good news of my sacrifice and the hope of eternal life through him, um, as well as teach Christian principles, which we call discipling. Um, go and teach the things that I've taught you, teach it to other people so that they can do the same. This whole uh, regeneration, reproduction process of kind of continuing the, this, you know, go forth and multiply kind of thing, but not just spreading humanity, but spreading uh, the gospel message. So, any questions so far? That's fast review. It's mostly review, but it's worth getting out there again. I think it's me and I'll let to do it. So. Uh, so, okay, Jesus is in heaven. Uh, 40s or 50s A.D., somewhere around 10 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Paul's missionary journeys. He goes on three missionary journeys. Um, four. Is it four? He, he, he does a lot of travel. Uh, he, goes, he goes all over the place. He's a wild man. He starts out persecuting and then, then goes out to spread the gospel. 
That happens, 40 or 50 AD. Um, in the 50s and 60s ballpark, the <coughs> synoptic gospels are written, which means Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic, they're, they're basically chronological. Um, you can lay those three together, and there's a whole lot of overlap between them. John is a little bit of a different animal. Um, but those synoptics were written in the 50s and 60s. Paul's writings primarily were written in that same time period as well. Um, okay, in the mid-60s, not long after that, Rome burns. Um, wanting a scapegoat, Nero blames it on the Christians, which was a good place to put it because there was already a lot of, um, they were not a real popular group. Um, Christianity was an illegal religion at the time, so why not blame it on them? So, uh, Christian persecution has accelerated. Now, not only do you have the Jews chasing the Christians down, like Paul had done before his conversion, but now you've got the Romans going after him too. So it's not a bright day to be a Christian. Um, uh, somewhere in the mid-60s, Peter and Paul, not the group, uh, <coughs> but the apostles are both martyred at Nero's hand. Okay? Peter's crucified upside down, I believe Paul's beheaded. Um, both around you know, 65, 66, somewhere in there. Uh, 70 AD, um, Roman troops under Emperor Titus laid siege to Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. This is going to be a very frustrating pattern. Um, they've built and destroyed two temples, and these were long construction projects. Um, uh, okay, so, so Jerusalem's gone, Rome's burned, not a good time around then. Around 90 AD, John, the Apostle John, is exiled to the island of Patmos. He had been whipped, stoned, boiled, and everything. He would not die. So they said, just ship him away. He's in irritation. Just get him where we don't have to deal with him. He's on the Isle of Patmos, and around 180, somewhere 90, 100, something like that, he writes his gospel in the book of Revelation. Um, so his, because of that lapse, he's surely seen what Matthew, Mark, and John have had to say. Um, he's, he's seen other, <coughs> he's seen the writings of Paul. He certainly talked to the, these guys or heard of them, you know, secondhand or whatever. So um, he knows what ground has been covered. So his... That's why his gospel takes a different flavor. It's not chronological necessarily. Uh, it's written in a lot of tone and there's a lot of different with it. Also, mentioned briefly this morning, um, uh, John lived long enough to see the rise and spread of Gnosticism. There had been Gnostic Jews, but Gnostic Christianity sprung up and was becoming quite prominent where people said, yeah, Jesus had some cool teachings, but I got the secret info. Um, there's these keys. Once you know these keys, you know, you can know uh, the real way, the real way to God, the real way, whatever. We were at a book sale the other day, and it's interesting how many, even today, how many books say the secret keys or things they don't want you to know, or whether it's about medicine or religion or whatever. People always want to find the stuff that's being hidden from them. So that was popular then. That's something you'll see in John's letters, uh, First, Second, and Third John. A lot of people figure that he was specifically targeting them to Gnostics, to people who say that there's a secret knowledge. And, and if you read uh, his writings, it's pretty clear that he's saying, no, it's been revealed. Jesus is and was, was and is God. This is the path. Um, so by 100 AD, roughly, John is killed, and that's the end of the apostolic age. All the apostles have now been martyred. Uh, all been killed in one way or another. Um, so they're all gone by 100 AD. So we're now of the early church. So the early church technically started, you know, the day after the day Jesus rose. I mean, that changed things. People started gathering and had different patterns and uh, uh, different ways of thinking. Primarily, in the early church, what is the early church? I don't know. I, I guess something like mid 30s <coughs> AD, or somewhere around 400 AD, for just a broad area, broad time group, time lapse. Um, it was primarily an underground movement. These guys have uh, the, the, the ruling religion, Judaism, and the ruling uh, political power, Rome, both after to kill them. Um, they're meeting underground, meeting secretly in homes, in catacombs, whatever. They're, they're, um, they're, they're meeting underground. So there's not a lot happening historically because they're trying to stay alive. You don't have a whole lot of big symposiums you know, you don't go meet at the conference center to have a big symposium on what we believe and everything. It would make it too convenient to kill you. 
So <laughs> the, the count, church councils and things like that, that's one criticism people will say, well, how come they didn't start talking about this until you know, the 300s and 400s? Because it was illegal and they were being killed if they were in the, in the um, daylight. So the purpose of the early church, or some of the purposes that are really interesting from that 30s to 400, one of the things they did is formed a chain of custody. If you see, um, if you watch a crime show or watch it, you know, how a, a documentary on a, some trial that they're following detective pro, um, process when they're checking out the information, doing their investigating, um, they have this thing called chain of custody. They want to make sure that when they pick up a piece of evidence, it's kept intact so that it doesn't get, you know, fingerprints wiped off or, or um, names erased or whatever. They want to know where was this recorded, who did it. Where was it found? How long has it been around? They put it in a bag, all that kind of stuff. They did the same kind of thing back then. Not the same way that we see on CSI, but it's a very similar process. Um, what they did is had um, these, well, there's a, uh, quite an oral tradition back then. People would sit at the feet of Paul or John or whoever, these different disciples that traveled all over. Um, and Thomas went to India and Paul went everywhere. Um, and people would sit and learn from them and then pass that information on. So you've got these people you know, spreading this information on, but you've also got these books that have been written that are also traveling out. And people can see that this stuff lines up and it checks out. If you look at the progression, this chain of custody, for instance, John had um, disciples named Ignatius, Papias, and Polycarp. Um, then those three uh, kind of mentored a guy named Ir Irenaeus. Um, that gets us up to 200 BC or 200 AD. Peter um, had Mark and Justice and uh, Clement of Alexandria, all these people that were in this lineage that they passed from one to the next. Um, Paul, too many to mention, because <laughs> he would talk to people in these different areas, and then they would all talk. And so his his impact was even greater. So you've got only I don't know eight or nine hops of of transfer of information between. The, the resurrection and these early church councils. It's not that long. I mean, if you think just in terms of how many hops there have been, and if you consider these hops have happened geographically, very wide, widely spread out areas. So if somebody wanted to argue, well, you know, this is a telephone game. It went, you know, crazy, whatever. Well, the telephone game, you're trying to be kind of obscure. You're whispering. You're doing it in secret. This was not in secret. This was, they were trying to be very clear. They didn't want to make a humorous game. They wanted to actually communicate something they thought was true. So you've, ha you've got it happening in different time periods, different languages, different parts of the world. And not only is everything that these people are passing along roughly the same, but it also matches what's being sent out in these letters that being, are being distributed, which we call the, you know, the books of the New Testament now. <clears throat> so that, there's your chain of custody establishing that the teachings of Jesus and the apostles are being handed down, and it's it's what we have today. Um, let's see, I want my ask script. Um, so the, and you know that kind of brings in what we call a canon today. Now, the canon is canon means a rule or measuring stick. Um, it's basically guidelines. How do we determine what something is? Um, a lot of people will have you will, will suggest that the canon was a group of books that were put together in a smoky room by a dirty group of conspirators, you know, in secret, and they wanted to make this religion called Christianity, so they came up with, we're going to throw out the Gospel of Thomas, because we don't want people knowing that stuff. It's crazy, though, read sometimes. They, they act as though they weeded out all the good stuff and just kept the stuff that they wanted. Well, you don't have to read very much to see that that didn't happen. It was not a secret process. Um, it was very much public. Some churches even did include these other books, like the Gospel of Thomas and, and um, you know, a, a number of other Gnostics and other writings. But they fell out of favor because over time people realized publicly and in all these different areas on their own, they don't fit the criteria. They were not written by apostles or their associates. Um, they had um, significant contradictions with other books. Um, what is the Gospel of Thomas? I thought Thomas was a disciple. Thomas was, but the Gospel of Thomas was not written by Thomas. Oh. The Gospel of Thomas was written about 100 years too late for it to have been by him. Oh, okay. So you got two things. One, it says crazy stuff. Um, talks about a cross coming out after the crucifixion and the resurrection. The cross tells people to go preach. No, Jesus did. Crosses don't talk. 
Um, it's got some goofy stuff. Um, but also, it claims to be by Thomas, and it couldn't have been. Um, also, you have things like they don't, they don't claim to be inspired, where, you know, Paul writes, he says, I'm writing on the authority of Jesus Christ, or, you know, um, they, they're very different books. If you read them carefully, they're um, just on what they claim of themselves, very, very different kind of things. Did any of the other 12, um, four of the other, I should say eight of the 12 that didn't write books, did they ever write a gospel? Gospels? Not likely, at least not that we have. There are things recorded, such as a book called the Didache, which means the Teachings of the Twelve. Um, that's a book, it wasn't canonized, a lot of churches did keep it. Um, but that was a book that, it's, it's very interesting historically, it, it's the Teachings of the Twelve where people compiled what all the disciples taught. Um, so it's got things in there like, if there is a speaker traveling in the area, <coughs> What do you do with him? You should take him in for a day or two and let him speak. If he wants to stay longer than that, he's a freeloader. You know, send him <laughs> on his way. Um, how, to, how to handle a collection of offerings. How to pay your, your people. How to, how to do um, what is inappropriate with means of baptism and um, communion, things like that. So their teachings are kept in those sorts of things. As far as gospels, though, or things that we can directly attribute to them writing, no, it's just the ones that we have in the, in the New Testament now. Good question, though. Um, other interesting things that, that kind of reinforce the, what we have as a canon. Um, a guy named Marcion, who was a heretic, um, was a critic of Christianity, trying to knock down Christianity. He was, I think, 150, 170, somewhere in there, AD. He starts criticizing Christianity. And he says, all these stuff in their crazy books, you know, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he names all these books. Well, he just listed all the books that we hold. So, if you got the bad guys affirming what everyone else says, it's kind of hard to say that it was a conspiracy. You know what I'm saying? So, we've got, we've got people that are intending to pass it on accurately, and the people who are intending to pass it on inaccurately are saying, these are the works that we're looking at. So, I think it's safe to say that was, those were the works. Um, also, just a few generations after Jesus, a guy named Tatian um, wrote what's called the Diatessaron. He took Matthew, Mark, and Luke and made what's called a harmony of the Gospels. Tried to make one book that contained everything. And you can still get, not his version, but you can get a book called the Harmony of the Gospels where they just take, usually they'll start with one book like Mark and they'll fill in anywhere Mark has a gap that Matthew or Luke fills in, they'll, they'll stick that in so it kind of reads as a, a fuller account. But when, when Tatian wrote it and used the four Gospels, that was another kind of stamp that not that long after Jesus this is what he used, so why is he using only these? It's just kind of another indication that he was using the right stuff. Um, so we, we had all the apostles killed. All these early church leaders were killed too. Um, martyred. Uh, I don't want to get too far off into the whole martyrdom thing. It's, there's a, a, it's very interesting. Hundreds and hundreds of people that were martyred. But some things to keep in mind about this process. If Christianity were true, if we're not true, sorry. The earliest of martyrs, which would be Jesus' apostles and immediate followers, they would have given their lives for something they knew to be false. Right? They knew for a fact that he didn't say these things or he didn't rise or whatever. Who would die for that? They have nothing to gain. Um, some religious zealots to die today will die for things they think are true because they believe them to be true. That's fine, you see. You see Muslims, and, and across the board, you see religious people die for things they think are true. But they're not things they know to be true, that, that they know to be false, I should say. It's a big difference between dying for something you believe and dying for something you know is wrong. Uh, nobody does that. Um, so why would they do that? 100% of, of, of these people did that. Also, none of the Christian martyrs died defending themselves. Once they were captured, and oftentimes they turned themselves in. So they come to the church who's in charge here. That's me. And they'd be let off, and they know who, who it is that's coming and why. Um, there's stories of people coming to take someone. Um, I can't remember which one this was. It might have been um, atheist. I'm not sure. Somebody's coming to, to take him okay, from home, and his son says, take me too. And his mom's going, no, no, no. You, you can't go yet, you know, you go ahead and carry on your death. Well, I believe in Jesus too. I heard all the stuff Dad heard. No, stop. <laughs> I'm losing enough already. I mean, this, people were, it was, it was a thing of honor to be taken. They didn't fight. 
You'll see why that's important when we, when we come later to some Mormon claims. Um, but they all accepted their fate, fate peacefully without fighting back. So, before I go on and get to the church councils, any, anything that was confusing that I missed? All of it. Okay, after this period, the, the, you know, kind of underground church, early church, um, eventually, oh, let me skip that for a second, uh, we started having church councils. Anyone know what the first church council was? There's one big, big deal that's recorded in the Bible, a few other minor ones. Jerusalem Council? Jerusalem yeah. Council, yep, Acts 15, um, uh, We'll get to that, what the topic was in a second. But we do have recordings of councils happening in the Bible. The, something to keep in mind is there's all kinds of um, talk out there, rumors, whatever, innuendo, that these councils were times, kind of like the, the claims of the canon, these councils were times when people got together and said, you know, no, Jesus would roll over in his grave right now if he knew that people were calling him God. Because they got together in these councils and they... they they, they said, let's make him God, because they don't have a religion, they can make money and whatever. Um, there's all these claims that that's what councils were for. There was no such thing as a trinity, they invented that. Uh, the canon was invented in a council. These are claims of what happened to councils. This is not what happened to councils, I'll, I'll skim through some of them. But the point of councils, keep in mind, they were always corrective. Council was never formed to say, let's make up something new. Councils were always formed in order to respond to something bad that was happening, a heresy, usually. There's some crazy teaching that's spreading that they go, okay, we've got to stop this because it's becoming a problem. Um, that's always what happened. Uh, and it wasn't done by popular vote. They didn't get together and say, so what do you say, infant baptism? You know, it wasn't like that. It was saying, here's the question on, you know, this is what we believe Jesus taught, this is what another teaching is, who wants to make a case, a scriptural case, with a scriptural basis, um, and, you know, from, the, from the scriptural record and the early church fathers, showing what Jesus actually taught. Can you make a case for this? And then they would vote, not popular vote, but saying, have they made the case? Is this in keeping with what the Bible says? So, um, back to Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council was about 50 AD. The basic topic was conversion. Um, and the question was, do, do Gentiles have to convert to Judaism before converting to Christianity? Because that was a split in the church. There were some people, some Christians who held, if someone wants to be a Christian, because Christian origin, Christianity was originally a sect of Judaism, and that's how it was seen, they said, okay, well, you've got to go through that step. If you want to be a Christian, you've got to be a Jew first, then you can be a Christian. Uh, no, no, no. Paul, Barnabas, Peter, all the apostles and elders in Jerusalem, but those were the, the key guys that, that had it out. Uh, interesting read um, in Acts 15 and I think Galatians uh, was referred to it. Uh, what's interesting though, that's in AD 50. Jesus died in the 30s. So we got 15 or 20 years to work out this doctrine. I mean, there, where this is being taught improperly or practiced improperly to some degree in certain areas. So, when people say, you know, refer to um, processes taking a while, well, they do. I mean, things, it takes a while to realize that this is a problem. It takes a while to deal with it appropriately sometimes. Um, I'll skip, the, there are a handful of councils that, like I said, this were underground here. These were not really widespread councils um, up until 325. There were maybe six in that intermediate time. Uh, they got together, you know, important things like when exactly was Easter? We want to nail that down. Um, I mean, yeah, they're good, but it's not doctrinal specific things. Um, during this time, there were people who, there were some people, church members, who decided when the, when the Romans would come knocking, are you a Christian? Nope, not me, I want to live. Um, then, after Christianity stopped being illegal, these people came back to the church, knocked on the door, said, hey, remember me? I used to come here. Um, yeah, you stopped coming here. Well, yeah, they're going to kill me. Okay, so you stopped being a Christian because you didn't want to lose your life. So they had several councils saying, what do we do with these people? Can, and it, it's a very interesting read, do we just say, okay, well, you can come back in? Or do we say, no, you, I mean, you prove that you're not committed to this belief. Or is there some in, in between where we can work them back in by proving that they actually believe it? And, and what do you do with that? I mean, that was, a, that was a, 
a, a serious issue that had to be dealt with. What is a Christian? I mean, it kind of all goes to that. Um, those kind of things were teased out, you know, in the in the hundreds and two hundreds. Um, uh, two sixty four. There's a Council of Antioch um, where a Sabellianism was starting to become popular. Uh, that's still big news today. Um, it's known by modalism sometimes. Um, they believe the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were one. God is one. We agree. But they believed he's one person, not one nature and three different persons in that nature, but one person that just showed himself different ways, like he was a manifestation. He looked like God the Father and sometimes looked like Jesus and sometimes looked like the Holy Spirit. So they, they wanted to deal with that. Uh, 325 AD is the first council of Nicaea. These are called ecumenical councils because at, that, at this point, um, now uh, Constantine is emperor and he decides Christianity, well he converts, so it's a big deal, um, and he decides Christianity is no longer illegal because he can't be doing an illegal thing. So he calls the First Council of Nicaea in 325, which is one that's very popular if you read any of Dan Brown's writings. Uh, he likes to mischaracterize everything about what happened there. Um, his, one, the main issue there, what, and this gets into real nitty gritty stuff, but where God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, were they the same substance or were they a similar substance? Which sounds silly, but it gets very, I mean, the implications are huge when you read the, the details. Um, Arius was the guy that taught this. Arians today are people like the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, they hold these kind of beliefs, but an interesting thing that uh, Jesus being the same substance as a father is a, is a word called homoousios. Jesus being a similar substance to the father is called, called homoousios. There's one letter of difference, the letter I. If you hear the phrase, it doesn't make an iota of difference. That's where it came from. So if you're going to use it correctly, an iota of difference is a big deal. <laughs> Change church direction. Um, so um, just only thing I'm going to say in, in reference to um, Nicaea, they didn't discuss the canon like Dan Brown says. They didn't discuss a lot of things he says. They didn't establish Jesus' divinity. People will say, nobody thought Jesus was divine. They, they set that up at Nicaea. No, almost everyone thought Jesus was divine. The question was, what is the nature of his humanity? And how does that all work out? And how does it relate to him being God? Um, he also says it was a close vote. If you call something like 320 to 2 a close vote, then you're in trouble. But that was Nicaea. Um, then the Council of Constantinople about more discussion on Arianism and modalism still in the picture. Um, some other things that happened. I uh, had a council in Ephesus. Can we really call Mary the mother of God? Because you know she didn't have God, but God, you know, Jesus was God. Um, lots of other things happened up until about 800. Okay, they're they're very interesting heresies that are addressed. Um, but just to get through the basics, there's a number of church councils that happened. So the first ones are called non-ecumenical councils. It's before Christianity was a, a legal religion. So they were just councils of the Christian leaders. From 325 to about 800, they were councils of the religion of Christianity, the religious leaders, as well as with political influence, because it was now a, an accepted religion. From about 800 on, there continued to be councils. However, those councils were called, that's when we call them the Roman Catholic Councils. They were called by the Roman Catholic Church. And by that time, throughout these other councils, I said, you'll see things like, um, oh gosh, the nature of the Holy Spirit and the nature of the Trinity and things like that that are, that are established where at each of these, there are some, sometimes minor, sometimes major splits where the Eastern Orthodox goes says, okay, we're going to peel off here and because we don't agree with you on this topic or um, you know the different different uh, branches of Christianity and that's why you'll see the Coptic Church and the you know the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Church and all these different churches Roman Catholic Protestantism didn't exist yet um, but they're all happening from that in that intermediate stage and like I said 800 on is just the Roman Catholic councils um, about 480 A.D. 480 is the end of the Roman Empire and the beginning of what we call the Dark Ages. Um, so from around 400 to 1400 is the Dark Ages, meaning 
a period of religious, cultural, and economic deterioration. Just things went to pot in a whole lot of different areas. Um, at the end of that, what really kind of kicked us out of that was the Protestant Re Reformation. It had implications beyond just you know, uh, Roman Catholicism. Um, an early Roman ca Catholic dissident named John Wycliffe was in the 1300s. He was speaking against different Catholic practices, which started out good. And remember, these early councils were the church. So the Roman Catholic Church holds to all these early ones that we hold to. So does the, you know, the Eastern Orthodox and all these others. It's as you go farther on, you start having these splits. So by the 13, 14, 1500s, you've got enough divergent teachings that are out there far enough that people go, okay, I think we've lost it somewhere. I want to go back a few hundred years to after that council. Um, John Wycliffe, John, uh, Jan Hus, uh, 1517, Martin Luther nails his 95 theses to uh, the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And it's a whole list of grievances. You know, we shouldn't do this, shouldn't do this. We can't be taking money from people. You can't sell baptism. You can't sell the dead into heaven. You can't do these kind of things. He didn't want to necessarily abolish Catholicism. He wanted Catholicism to stay, but be fixed. These issues that he had an issue with. Problems. Um, in 1521, he wasn't quieting down. The church didn't like what he was doing. He was excommunicated. Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland, uh, not too far away, heard about what Luther was doing in Wycliffe, and it resonated with him. And he went, yeah, i kind of been having those same feelings, and motivated by what Luther was doing, he decided to do something very much similar. Um, in the 1530s, John Calvin in France broke from the Roman Catholic Church and fled to Switzerland. So you see these names, Calvin, Luther, uh, Wycliffe. Um, the, these are the guys who either have their names still in denominations or their followers split off in denominations. Starting then is when the, Pro it's the Protestant Reformation, so Protestantism was birthed, but also when um, all the denominations we're familiar with now sprung up and they're, I mean, they continue to be uh, invented. Sometimes, you know, the only difference they have is whether it's a six-string or eight-string guitar. And I mean, <laughs> some of them are silly. Some of them are very fundamental differences. Many of them are. It just depends on what each group finds important. Sometimes it's an issue of, of doctrinal importance. Sometimes it's a preference. Sometimes it's regional. Whatever. They're all over the map. There's thousands of them. That's another discussion. But So now we're through, basically today, of how we've gotten to where we are with the Christian faith. Next week, we'll look at all the things we did last week and this week. What is Mormonism? Where do they break? Okay, there's a lot of things. They agree there's a God. They agree, you know, a number of things. I've said there was a guy named Jesus. He died. But, as I mentioned the first week, there are some things that they completely dispute. There are some things they add to history that are completely foreign to anything. Um, and there's some things where they claim the same thing we do, but they pour a different meaning into every word in the statement so that the ultimate statement means an entirely different thing. So next week we'll go over what those things are and how that all cashes out historically. Did it. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>